Amen. Well, amen. Holy is He. If you have your Bibles, you're going to be turning to the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 13. As you're turning there, I want to remind you that tonight begins our first of our four enlarging our tent dinners. We set those up for A through D is tonight, E through L is tomorrow night, M through R next Sunday night, and then S through Z on the following Monday night. We did that in order to be able to have time and to be able to sit down and to share with you about enlarging our tent and how we can participate. You'll be receiving a little booklet like this, Enlarging Our Tent, which will give you detail after detail of what we're doing and what God's doing and kind of recap uh, the ministry there at Dearmville and how God led us to do that. The reason we had the dinner is to be able to share this with you, to be able to explain it to you, give you an opportunity to ask questions, and then for you to know how to pray that God might have you involved. I think some people are fearful to come to the dinner. They think I'm going to hog tie them or, or make them do something they ought not do. I promise you, you don't know me very well because that's not the way I work. I'm simply going to share with you what God's doing and invite you to be a part of that and to be a part of investing in what God is doing. I don't know if you realize that last week three people came to know Christ at the Iron Bowl. So far, we've had five people accept Christ that are going to be baptized the next week or so at the De Arnville campus, along with around about 120 in worship and a lot of exciting things. And I'm glad we're able to be a part of that. And I want to be a part of it. And part of that is to get that indebtedness paid because I don't want to pay the bank anymore than we have to. So we can use that money that we give towards uh, ministry and reaching people for Christ. And so this is an effort that we're putting together to be able to get that accomplished. And all we ask is you pray about what the Lord would have you do and be a part of it. Everybody will be receiving a packet. If you don't come, you're still going to get the packet. It just allows you to have a chance to look at it, to answer or ask questions, have those questions answered so that you'll be able to know that because I don't have time to answer everybody's questions when they call individually. So if you're able to come, I encourage you to come. Uh, if you are the, in that uh, dinner tonight and you didn't make reservations, just see me. We'll be glad to uh, make arrangements. The reason we need that is just to make sure we have enough food prepared for everybody. And the ones for tomorrow night and next Sunday and Monday, those reservation lists are out there in the welcome area. So you can go by and sign or you can call in to make those arrangements so we can make sure that you're there. But we have a fun time. going to be music and some testimonies about what God is doing. And then visit. It'll be about an hour, hour and 15 minutes to the most. So I hope you'll come and be a part of that. We've been talking about becoming a better friend of Jesus. And last week we were at that part where we revealed that to be a friend of Jesus and for Jesus to be our friend, sometimes in friendship... There are wounds. It says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. And whenever you love somebody as a friend, sometimes you have to point out and you have to reveal to them where they've done something that's wrong. We saw that in the life of Jesus with His disciples. Whenever His disciples would make a mistake, when they'd go the wrong direction, when their heart wasn't where it should be, Jesus would correct them. He would help them to know that's not the way you're to live, that's not the way you're to act. And it would help them know how they ought to live. But we also shared that not only did he do that with the disciples that he walked with on this earth, but he also said that the Holy Spirit of God was going to come and be in the heart of every believer. And the Holy Spirit is Jesus. So we have Jesus in us. And as we live our lives, we have that same opportunity where Jesus comes along in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And when we do something wrong or we think some way or our attitude is not right, then the Holy Spirit comes and He points a finger in our heart. It's called conviction. Whenever the Holy Spirit comes and convicts us and reveals to us that what we're doing, what we're saying, how we're acting is not consistent with God's will and God's word, then He convicts us. I think we all know we're children of God because whenever we sin, the Holy Spirit of God comes along and convicts us. But I want to share today a message that helps us to understand what happens then. Does Jesus just come along and convict us? Or what else does Jesus do? And in the story that we're going to read today, you're going to find out that Jesus says He doesn't just come along to convict His children but he also comes along to forgive his children and to help them and to minister to them once he's revealed to them that sin is in their lives. 
You ever thought about what is the last ministry of Jesus to His disciples before He went to the cross? Not talking about His teaching ministry or His preaching ministry, but something that He would actually do for them and do to them before He was crucified. You know what it is? It's to wash the disciples' feet. To wash the disciples' feet. It's found in John 13. There in the upper room where they're having the Lord's Supper and where He's going to leave from there and go to the Garden of Gethsemane and then is going to be tried and crucified. That night, Jesus does something that is recorded in John's Gospel about the washing of His disciples' feet. And there's some physical reasons that that happens, but there's also a tremendous spiritual application of why that took place that tells us about how good of a friend Jesus is to us and challenges us to be that good of a friend to Jesus. That's what it says in John 13, beginning in verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into His hands and that He had come forth from God and was going back to God, He rose from supper and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, girded himself about. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he he was girded. And so he came to Simon Peter and he said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, you ought to underline this phrase, What I do, you do not realize now, but you shall understand hereafter. Hear what he says? What I do to you, you don't realize right now, but you'll understand later. Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, Not my feet only, but also my hands, my head. Wash me all over is what he's saying. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason, he said, Not all of you are clean. And so when he had washed their feet and taken his garment and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. And if I then, the Lord, the teacher, wash your feet, and you also ought to wash one another's feet. Now, you're very familiar with that story. Probably you've heard that many times, heard it taught, preached. Most of the times when we talk about that story, we talk about how humble Jesus was and the fact that He's Lord and Master. And He comes along and He washes His disciples' feet when basically that's the responsibility of a servant. And and all of that would be true. But I want you to notice that phrase in there where Jesus says, What I'm doing for you, what I'm really doing for you, Peter, you do not realize now. But there's coming a time, talking about when the Holy Spirit would come, when the Holy Spirit would enlighten his heart and his mind and teach him all things that Jesus had done for him and brought to him. In that day, you're going to understand what I am doing for you, what I am actually doing and what I will want you to do for your brothers and sisters in Christ. There's a deeper meaning. Well, let's just talk about the physical aspect of what was taking place here. In those days, whenever they ate, they ate different than we do. I don't know about you, but today, whenever I go home and eat, I will pull up to a table in a chair, and I'll sit upright, and and I'll enjoy my meal on the top of that table. That's not the way that they ate. In their time, the way they ate, their tables were shorter, and they reclined at the table. They literally lay on their side, And they were lying down as they were eating. Now, I don't know about you, that doesn't sound real comfortable to me. I just soon eat the way I do, and that's the way they did it. They reclined at the table, and they enjoyed their meal. Well, because they reclined at the table, and because their feet were about the same height as the table, 
not a great distance in that, then one of the things that they would do before they ate was to wash their feet. Because the table was not much higher than their feet and they were all laying there and their feet being dirty would not be a wonderful thing to experience as they reclined next to one another. Now probably some of you have come in before and and eaten breakfast or dinner or supper or whatever, you probably with dirty feet and it didn't bother you a bit, right? I mean, you stuck those dirty feet under the table, it didn't bother you anything, you just ate your meal. Well, let me ask you a question. What if you stuck your feet on the table and ate? Would you think it would be important to wash your feet? Yes, it was. So there was a practical reason for that, that they washed their feet. Not only the fact that they washed their feet and the need to wash their feet, but they lived in that time where they walked with open-toed sandals. So even if they had bathed before they came to the dinner, as they walked on those dusty roads, their feet would become dusty. And even if they were clean all over, they still needed their feet washed in order to prepare and to be ready for dinner. Now that responsibility of washing someone's feet in a home was typically the responsibility of the lowest of servants. If you were the low man on the totem pole, it was your job to wash feet. That was not a job of high esteem. That was a lowly job that a servant would do. Now most of us think about that, well I don't think that's too big of a job. I mean I'd I'd wash somebody's feet. Well in our day and time sure because we're sitting here with shoes on and and we have socks on and everything else. And I mean, we wouldn't think too bad about that. But, but in that day, that would have been a horrible thing for them to have to do, a lowly thing for them to do, to wash somebody's feet. I, I guess the way to describe it in our day and time might be to, to take care of somebody's bedpan. That would be a kind of a not fun job. It would kind of be the one with the, the longest straw who has to do that. That's the way it was. It was viewed in that way. But here is Jesus who gets up while his disciples are reclining there and he girds himself, he takes the basin and the towel and here is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings who begins to wash the disciples' feet. He washes their feet for a practical reason for they're enjoying a meal together but he does it because there's a spiritual reason and something he wants them to understand and to never forget because it reminds them when they can view it in their minds of him kneeling before them, washing their feet. What was that significance? Well, I don't know about you, but I'm glad Peter was there. Amen? (laughs) I love Peter. I mean, Peter is there so many times to help us know things. I mean, it seemed like to me if Peter wasn't there, Jesus would just wash their feet. All it says is Jesus got up, washed their feet, went and sat down. But not with Peter. When Peter's there, he always asks questions. Even when he sticks his foot in his mouth, he usually comes up with some pretty good answers from Jesus that we need to know. And once again, Peter is the one who stands forth. And he says, as though the others could not care, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Lord, are you washing my feet? Why are you washing my feet? And that's when Jesus said, why I do this, you do not understand, but there will be a day that you will understand why I do this. And Peter says, Lord, you can, I, I will not let you wash my feet. You are not washing my feet. And Jesus says something very important at that time. And you need to underline that in, in, your, in your passage. He says, never shall you wash my feet. Verse 8, he says, Jesus said, underline this, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Now, he wasn't saying to him specifically, if you don't let me wash your feet, Peter, you're not going to go to heaven. That's not what he meant. He says this, I have to wash you. You have to be washed in order to have a relationship with me. You have to be washed in order to be a part of me. You have to be washed. Not talking about the washing of his feet. 
He's talking about something far more significant. The washing of his life. The washing of his body. The washing of his sin. That's important to know because Jesus says right there, if I don't wash a person, they are not going to be with me. They are not a part of me. Go on down when he reads and he says, all of you are clean except one is not. One has not been made clean. One is not washed. Talking about Judas Iscariot who had not believed in Jesus. But he says this, Peter, you've got to be washed. You're going to have to be cleansed in order to be with me. Now listen to what Peter says. Peter said, then Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. In other words, Lord, if being washed is, is to make me a part of you, then don't just wash my feet. Wash, wash me all over. I want to be a part of you. I want to be with you. I, I want to be in you. So wash me all over. Listen to what Jesus says there in verse number 9. He says, I mean, verse uh, number 10. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet but is completely clean. And you are clean except for one. What do you say to Peter? Peter, you've already been clean. You've already been bathed. You've already been washed. You don't have to be washed again. You don't have to be cleansed again. You've already been washed. All you need is for your feet to be washed. Now, when he told Peter, you've already been washed, what do you mean? Well, he wasn't talking about baptism. He wasn't talking about... He was talking about how you wash away a person's sin in order for that person to have a relationship with Jesus and God the Father. And how does that happen? Well, the Word of God teaches us. Go to your Bibles in Hebrews 9... And 10. You don't have to turn there now, but just read when you get home. In Hebrews 9 and 10, it tells us very distinctly how our sins are washed away or how we're washed to be made clean. It says that there's only one way that we can be made clean, and that is that we're washed in the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. And he says it's not the blood of bulls and calves, but rather it was the blood of the perfect Lamb of God, Jesus. And when Jesus came and he died on that cross and he shed his blood, all who have believed in him are washed and forgiven. We have been made clean. He says... We have been made clean. Peter and James and John, they had left those boats and they had followed after this one who's the Messiah. And they believed in him and what he said. And whenever he died on that cross, he paid the price where they had been washed. By faith they had trusted and Jesus had cleansed them just like it happened to you and me. There was that day in your life when it happened. I don't know when it was. I pray that it's happened. But it's that day when you believed in Jesus and you asked Him to be Lord and Savior of your life. And when that happened, He washed you in His blood and He made you clean. I'm here to tell you when Jesus forgives you of your sin, it is all forgiven, past, present, future sin. He died once for all, for all times. And He's made us clean. We are clean. We've been bathed. And therefore, we have a part in Him. We're a part of his family because we put our faith and our trust in Jesus. Wow. I'm here to tell you, friends, listen, where you sit today, if Jesus were to walk through here today, he would say, you're a part of me, you're a part of me, or he would say, you are not a part of me, all based on whether or not we've been bathed and cleansed by the Savior through his shed blood. And he said to Peter, Peter, you don't need to be washed all over. Peter, you don't need to be washed all over. You've been made clean. I've already bathed you. I've already made you right. You're fine, Peter. You're a part of me. 
But wait a minute. You still need your feet washed. You still need your feet washed. That's, that's what you need, Peter. You need your feet washed. What did he mean by that? Well, he, it was far more than just the ceremonial washing of the feet so that they could enjoy a meal together. Jesus was talking about something very significant that was going to be important for their lives and our lives as we walk daily. And that is this truth. That whenever you got saved, let me ask you, when you got saved, did you just get translated right up to glory? Well, I hope not because you're still sitting here, right? I mean, when we got saved, we didn't just immediately go to heaven. That would be nice, wouldn't it? I mean, the greatest thing God could do to us is take us to heaven. That's the truth. Most wonderful place will ever exist is going to be in heaven. That's going to be glorious. And God could have just saved us and taken us up to glory, but He didn't do that. He saved us and He called on us to not be of this world, but to live in this world. And to live for Him in this world and to make an impact in this world and to be the light and the love of Jesus for this world. He called us to live in this world. And from the day I got saved at seven until now, I've been walking in this world just as you've been walking in this world. Now we're aliens, we're not of this world and I'm feeling more like an alien all the time. But we're to travel through this world and we're to journey through this world. And we've been bathed and we've been washed and we're fine in our relationship. We're a part of God's family. But hold on a second. When you live in this world and you walk in this world, sometimes your feet can get dirty. Your feet ever get dirty? Well, let's say it a little bit different. Sometimes our hearts can get dirty. Sometimes our attitudes can get dirty. I don't know about you, but... I get dirty because when I live in this world, even though I'm saved and headed for heaven, I still sin. I still sin. Every day, I sin. I miss the mark some way, somehow. I miss the mark. And and living in this world and and, and serving the Lord and miss this world, that's not an easy task to do. But in in this world, I'll sin and, and I get dirty. But you know what Jesus says? Jesus says, when you get dirty... I want to keep washing your feet. I'm there to wash your feet. See, Jesus is such a good friend to us that He doesn't just come along when we do sin and by His Holy Spirit convict us and point that finger and we feel that guilt in our life because we've sinned and we've missed the mark. He's not just the one who points the finger. But He's also the one who says... And listen, if you you will agree with me that what I convict you of, that that sin, I'll wash your feet. I'll wash your heart. I'll wash you. That's what it says in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, you know what confess? Agree with God. To agree with God that what I thought, what I said, what I did was sin. To agree with God that when he comes and points that convicting finger in my heart and says, that's sin, I just agree with him. Lord, I agree that is sin and that's not what you want out of my life and that's what you, not what you desire. That's what it means to confess. I just confess and agree with God. What it says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And here it is. And to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That's not talking about the experience of salvation. We're already saved. It's talking about the journey of fellowship. And John says there, who wrote the gospel and also writes 1 John under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, let me tell you what, you have to have fellowship with Jesus and walk with Jesus and Jesus is so alive that if you will agree that whenever He convicts you of that sin, if you'll agree that it is sin, He will cleanse you. He will wash your feet. Wash your feet. 
He washes your feet when you sin against Him. When you've offended Him, He washes your feet. Well, I don't ever sin against God. I sin against everybody else. Oh, no. (laughs) It's not the way it works. Do you know what? Every sin you commit, no matter who you commit it towards, you sin against God. You first sin against God before you sin against anybody else. You remember when David committed sin with Bathsheba and then killed Uriah? Read his prayer in Psalm 51. This is what he says towards God. Against thee and thee alone have I sinned. Now, had he sinned against Bathsheba? Sure. Had he sinned against Uriah? Sure. But what he said is this. Before I ever sinned against either of them, I sinned first against you. And no matter what sin you commit or who you commit that towards, you sin against God. Hold on a second. But even though you sin against God, even though you sin against Jesus, Jesus says, if you will agree, if you'll admit that that's sin, I will wash your feet. I I will wash your feet. I will keep you clean when you journey through this life and when you're having to live in this world and your feet touch this world, I will keep you clean. I will constantly be washing your feet so you are acceptable to sit at the table, to recline at the table, to enjoy the feast and to fellowship with me. He keeps us clean. That's why Jesus said, listen, there's something far more important than me washing your feet so you can eat at this physical table. I want you to know that I'm there to wash your spiritual feet so that you might recline at my table. I want to not only clean you, but to keep you clean. That's the kind of friend Jesus is. Not just pointing out where we sin against Him, but kneeling before us and washing our feet. That's the kind of friend Jesus is. Hold on a second. What kind of friend are you to Jesus? What kind of friend are you to Jesus? Well, I told you last week, there's a great thing about being friend with Jesus. You'll never have to correct Him. You don't have to confront Him because He doesn't make any mistakes. That's a good thing. (laughs) That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? I mean, Jesus is absolutely perfect. You never have to go correct Jesus. And so you might think, well, wait a minute then, Brother Mac, if Jesus never sins, then how does that apply that I would be the friend of Jesus to sit at the feet of Jesus and to wash His feet? Why would I wash His feet? Because He never sins. How would I be forgiving Him? How would I do that? Hold on a second. Don't forget what Jesus said. Jesus made this statement, when you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've what? You've done it unto me. So how do you you sit at the feet of Jesus? How do you clean the feet of Jesus? How do you... By doing it to the least of these. You know what that means? That means anybody and everybody. You know what God wants us to be? You know how how good of a friend He wants us to be of His? He wants us to be such a good friend of His. Listen, that any time somebody sins against us, any time somebody offends us, does something wrong towards us, listen, you know what He wants us to do? He wants us to forgive them. He wants us to wash their feet. That's what He wants. And whenever we kneel before that person who's offended us and we wash their feet and that's a picture of forgiving them of their sin, when we do that, we're doing that before our friend Jesus as though Jesus himself is there. We wash his feet as we wash their feet, but we must be willing to forgive. One of the most difficult things that Christians face, and one of the things that hinders our spiritual lives is the sin of unforgiveness. The sin of unforgiveness. Somebody do something against us and offend us or hurt us in some way, and we'll carry that grudge in our heart. 
And, and we never are willing to gird ourselves and kneel down and wash their feet. Oh, but Brother Mike, you don't know what they did to me. You don't understand what they did to me. Let me tell you something. You did more to Jesus than they did to you. And He washes your feet regularly. Don't let unforgiveness keep you from kneeling down and washing that person's feet. Peter and them struggled with that, didn't they? Lord, how many times do we have to forgive somebody? Seven? No. Seventy times seven. That's not 490. That's every time they sin. And it's, it can be the same thing. No matter how many times they sin against you, you kneel down before them and you wash their feet. Why? Because Jesus did. Now, very quickly, I'm going to give you three things. If you don't hear another thing, hear this. It's in this passage. Three things you have to know for you to be able to be that kind of forgiving friend. It's all found in verse 3. What did Jesus know? Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into His hands. That's the first thing. Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into His hands. You know how you'll be forgiven of somebody else? Realize all that God has given to you. Realize who you are in God. Realize that you are a part of the King's family. Realize that everything that He has is yours. You are part of God's family. When you realize who you are and all that God has given to you and all He's made available to you, it'll enable you to forgive somebody else. There's a second thing, though, Jesus knew. Look what it says. It says, and He knew that He had come forth from God. He knew where He came from. Where did Jesus come from? He came from God. Now, the rest of us were created, but He came from God. He preexisted. He knew where He came from. Listen, if you'll know where you come from, it'll help you forgive others. Because you know where you came from? Let me tell you, you're a sinner just like everybody else. You understand that? If you'll remember that you're a wretched sinner just like everybody else, and there's not one thing somebody does that you, apart from the grace of God, couldn't do, if you'll realize you're a sinner forgiven, then it'll help you to be more forgiving and to be able to gird that towel and take that basin and wash somebody's feet. There's a third thing, though. And he knew he was going back to God. Listen, when you'll realize not only where you came from, but where you're headed to, that you're going to get to go and be with God, you're going to be in that perfect, glorious, wonderful place, you're going to have a time when you're not going to have to worry about your dirty feet, you have a time you got to worry about anybody sinning against you, or you sinning against anybody, or anybody offending you, or anything else. You're going to a glorious, wonderful place. When you know that, it ought to free you up to forgive folks. See, if you know those three things, that God has laid all things into your hand, you know where you came from, and you know where you're going to, then it ought to make you want to gird yourself with the towel, take the basin, and wash somebody's feet. And when you wash somebody's feet, you wash Jesus' feet. Not because He needs it, but because He said, when you do it to them, you do it to me. And because... I hope you get this image in your heart and your mind. Every day, every day, you are in need of Jesus kneeling before you and washing your feet as you've walked in this world. And He will, day in and day out, wash your feet. You know all He asks? Just agree that you need it. Don't try to hide it. So many of us try to hide things from God, don't we? Oh, I don't want God to see that. I, I don't want God to know that. I don't want anybody to know my feet are dirty. As long as you're playing games and you don't want to be honest and you don't want to confess it, He can't wash your feet. You'll carry that load of sin. You'll carry that guilt of sin. You'll carry that burden on your life. you just carry it around all the time. Not that you have to, just because you're not willing to admit it. But if you'll finally admit it and say, Jesus, look at my feet. Jesus will say, child, I can take care of that. I can take care of that. Let me kneel down here and wash your feet. You're clean already. You're a part of me already. But as you journey in this life, your feet can get dirty. 
but I'll wash them. We have a good Savior, a good Lord, and we're called to be like Him, to be just that forgiving of those who have need. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for the Holy Spirit of God. I thank You for Him being our teacher. I pray, Lord, for each of us as children of God, if, Father, our feet are dirty because we have sinned and our hearts are dirty because we've made wrong decisions, wrong attitude, wrong actions,